Let's compare Latter-day Saint theology with Protestant theology. Now, this video was inspired by a user on YouTube uh, named Charles Brown. He is a Latter-day Saint. I'm a Protestant. Uh, I enjoy watching his videos occasionally. Um, and the points uh, that he brought up in a recent video, we're going to kind of address here in this video. Now, one of the things he said was that Protestant salvation applies to a limited amount of people. It technically applies to anyone who accepts Jesus as their Lord and Savior. In true Christianity, we allow for free will. God will not force you to spend eternity with him if you do not want to because he is a loving God. As we will see with the theology espoused by Charles Brown, there is, in fact, no free will. Ironically, if we were to flesh out Latter-day Saint theology, which we will do later, there will not be a single person that will be saved and all will end up in hell. Thus, Protestant theology, Protestant salvation offers a hope which cannot be found within Mormonism. Charles said Protestants only believe God created one planet. Um, now, I think what he meant to say uh, was that we believe God made one earth, one unique place where humans exist and nowhere else, because technically Protestants believe God made millions of planets. There is technically you know, no evidence biblically or even scientifically for the contrary. Protestants believe the Father and the Son are a metaphor. Uh, Jesus is God's Son in the sense that he is God made manifest in human form. Judas is called the son of perdition, yet he was not actually a son of perdition. He was the son of Simon. Judas is not literally the son of destruction. Those were identities of Judas. Similarly, Jesus is not literally the son of God, but the son of God as he is God made manifest. One can argue this position from the Bible. The other position that he is a literal son cannot be argued from the Bible. He did not have a beginning as, as, we, as we do. Therefore, he is not a son in the sense of a literal offspring. He existed before he was born at Bethlehem. Now, I know uh, technically Latter-day Saints may argue uh, that our souls are eternal, but we'll, we'll get to that later. Protestants believe in ex nihilo creation. Uh, and yes, we do. And I know Latter-day Saints deny that um, because uh, they believe that the particles already existed. God just kind of reorganized them. Now, in the beginning is the concept of the beginning. In this passage, which, which ex nihilo typically, you know, we, we get this from Genesis 1. In this passage, it refers to an absolute beginning of time. Uh, the scholar Henry Blotcher writes, all the ancient versions of the Bible interpret it this way, as of course do most modern translations. The Apostle John confirms it when he echoes the prologue of Genesis and that of his gospel in John 1. When him concurs, the context here and in Genesis Genesis 1 suggests Rashith refers to the beginning of time itself, not to a particular period within eternity. Created. Waltek writes, a telic verb only finds meaning at the end of a process. The Hebrew term bara refers to created. Uh, it only refers to a completed act of creation. So it cannot mean that in the beginning, God began the process of creating the cosmos. A telic verb in Hebrew is speaking of completion. Um, in English, we might say, you know, he died. This would be a telic verb. But if we said he lives in New York, this would not. It would be the case of an ongoing action. Henry Blotcher writes, if the beginning mentioned in the opening verse is to be taken in an absolute sense, and if create is a verb of such force, are we to speak of creation out of nothing, ex nihilo? The verb bara contains the idea of creation ex nihilo, since it is never connected with any statement of the material. Without the idea being expressed clearly, we can say that the usage of the verb points in the direction of the notion of being produced from non-being. Protestants believe God created the world for no good reason. Uh, this is something Charles said in his video. Um, this is not what Protestants believe. Um, perhaps you believe it is no good reason. Um, however, we would appeal to the Bible. The Lord has made all for himself. All things have been, been created through him and for him. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and through whom are all things in 
uh, uh, being many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. Protestants don't believe the world was created for us to be the center of it, uh, to go off to become our own gods one day and have our own planets. We appeal to the Bible. You know, the Lord has made all for himself. Protestants came up with this idea of sola scriptura and sola fide. This is something Charles said. Um, they, they Protestants created their own authority. This is not historically true. They may have coined those terms and, and popularized them, but the concept actually can be traced to Christ through every generation to the Reformation. Let's just examine one of these for time's sake. Let's look at faith alone or sola fide. Jesus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now to the one who works, his wages is not credited as favor, but what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Let's turn to the second century. The Lord, therefore, was not unknown to Abraham, whose day he desired to see, nor again was the Lord's father, for he had learned from the word of the Lord and believed him. Wherefore, it was accounted to him by the Lord for righteousness, for faith towards God justifies the man. Third century. Paul is saying that justification of faith alone suffices, so that the one who believes is justified even if he has not accomplished a single work. Only faith in Christ is salvation for us. Let's turn to the 5th century. Paul quoted Habakkuk for the benefit of the Jews because he wanted to teach them not to cling to the professions of the law, but to follow prophets for many centuries before they had predicted that one day, there would be salvation by faith alone. The blessed Paul argues that we are saved by faith, which he declares to be not from us, but a gift from God. Thus, there cannot possibly be true salvation where there is no true faith. And since this faith is divinely enabled, it is without doubt bestowed by his free generosity. The seventh century, God who makes the unclean clean and removes sin justifies the sinner apart from works. In the 8th century, the Apostle Paul preached that we are justified by faith without works. In the ninth century, those who are saved are saved by grace alone, not by any works or merits of their own. For as you know, I neither fasted nor kept vigils nor slept on bare ground, but to borrow from the psalmist's words, I humbled myself, and in short, the Lord saved me. Or to put it even more briefly, I did no more than believe, and the Lord accepted me. Do you hope and believe that not by your own merits, but by the merits of the passion of Jesus Christ, that you may attain to everlasting salvation? I do. Your power to make men righteous is measured by your generosity in forgiving. Therefore, let the man who through sorrow for sin, uh, for sorrow for sin, hunger and thirst for righteousness, first in the one who changes the sinner into a righteous man and judges righteous in terms of faith alone. He will have peace with God. There are many others we could look at, and within each century, there are even other theologians who espouse this uh, theology, but this is just a brief sample. Protestants can trace our beliefs back to every century to Jesus. Can Latter-day Saints? I would argue no. Many of their beliefs cannot be found even in Jesus' own, own teachings. So do with it as you will. Protestants believe in a falling away. This is something that uh, Charles stated. Now, we believe in a reformation, not a restoration. There is a difference in those words. Okay, uh, you, that does not mean there was a falling away. That does not mean that at all. The Reformation essentially worked to bring the church back under the authority of Scripture. And this, this is not meant to be a, a prologue over the Reformation, um, but the, it's a complicated issue. At the end of the day, we do not believe in a restoration. Uh, th there is a difference between those words. These are some other claims that you made, Charles. First, you said that 
you know, you can tell something is good by their fruit, then you appeal to having a wife and a child. And, you know, that's something good. I, I would say that I could appeal to that as well. I have a child. I have a wife. Many other Christians do as well. There's Muslims that do as well. Would you say those are all good fruit as well? The second thing you said was that all knowledge, God has it. Now, I want to say you're stealing from the Christian worldview here, um, and I would encourage you not to do that. You should espouse your beliefs and not borrow from others' beliefs uh, for yourself. Your God does not have all knowledge. Okay, Your prophets have stated God himself is increasing and progressing in knowledge. Okay, um, to deny this is to deny what your prophets teach. And that is one of the points you make later in your video is that you guys have prophets. Okay, another thing you said was that for 1,500 years, Catholics were telling people how to be saved was wrong. Well, we just demonstrated that the concept of faith alone uh, was not something that came out of nowhere in the 1500s. Okay, um, this was a concept that existed through every generation from Christ all the way till today. Uh, so that's not true at all, that statement that you made. So these are some claims that you made, um, and some of them aren't officially what the church teaches, and I think you would agree with, with some of these. Some of these are your own statements, but let's just kind of get into some of them. You made the claim that hell is a place where people go until they rectify their thinking with God. They go to hell till they accept Jesus, is what you're saying. This means they have no free will. One way or another, according to this statement you made, they will accept God according to this logic. This is a denial of free will. And I know your church pushes agency and all that, but if this is true, and if this is what your church teaches, and I'm not saying it does, this means there is no free will. You also said LDS exercise faith in their Redeemer. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I don't deny that. But who is their Redeemer? Okay? There is a distinction between the Jesus that Latter-day Saints espouse versus the, the, the Christian, the true Jesus. You know, Jesus warns us of false Christs. You know, Matthew 24, um, there will be other false Christs. Your church has taught that Jesus was not born of a virgin. There are many sources on this. The Christian Jesus was born of a virgin. Your Jesus is not eternally God. He is a created being, whereas the Christian Jesus is eternally God. Jesus atoned in the garden. Now, I know there are sources that say it, it's the garden to the cross, um, but there are some sources I could pull up, which I'm not going to for time's sake, that say he atoned completely in the garden. Now, whether it's from the garden to the cross, regardless, Scripture's clear. He doesn't atone in the garden. And if you think about it logically, it doesn't make sense because Jesus has this cup of suffering, which Latter-day Saints identify as suffering for sin. And at the very end, as he's leaving the garden, it's as if Jesus hasn't suffered yet. He hasn't received this cup. You know, he, he's, he's talking to Peter. And he's like, shall I deny what the, what the Lord has set, what God has set in front of me? And it just logically doesn't make sense for him to be atoning in the garden. But we can get into that another time. Your church teaches that Jesus was born at Jerusalem. Now, you might sit here and say, at Jerusalem, that's a region of, you know, Bethlehem is a region of Jerusalem. It's a suburb. They're five miles away. That is not historically true. That has never been true. Biblically, it is not true. They are two distinct cities in two different tribal uh, allotted territories. Benjamin belonged to Jerusalem. The, the Jerusalem belonged to ben, the tribe of Benjamin. And Bethlehem belonged to Judah. They're in two different tribal areas. They're distinct. Meanwhile, the true Christian Jesus we know was born at Bethlehem. Your Jesus cannot save you in your sins. You know, he can only save you from your abandoned sins, to quote uh, your prophet uh, Spencer Kimball. Jesus can save you in your sins. The true Christian Jesus can. Jesus did not establish his church when it was already here. It was already established. Um, but the Christian Jesus, he established his church when he was here on earth. Jesus didn't atone for all sins. Uh, Jesus did atone for all sins. 
So there, there are some differences here between the Jesus of Christianity and the true Jesus, and these are just a few examples. But to say you put your faith in your Redeemer, you exercise your faith in your Redeemer, yes. But at the end of the day, who's your Redeemer? Is it the true Christian Jesus or is it a fantasized false Christ? You said LDS theology is pure and simple. Let's compare. Your church teaches you, number one, must have faith in Jesus. You then must be baptized. You must receive the laying on of hands to become a a confirmed member of the church and to receive the Holy Ghost. The brethren obviously go on to receive the Melchizedek priesthood. Then you must receive the temple endowment. Then you must be married for eternity, either in this life or in the next. So you can say this is pure and simple, okay? However, true Christianity teaches that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from, your, from the dead, you will be saved. That's it. At the end of the day, what is simpler? What your church teaches or what true Christianity teaches? And I think it's pretty clear. You made the claim that your church gets its direction from living prophets and apostles. <clears throat> And I've always found this interesting that Latter-day Saints make this claim, yet they will then go on to deny what prophets and apostles have taught. But regardless, let's look at some of the things here. First off, the Bible teaches you don't need a living prophet. You know, God tells us, Amos 3.7, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, his prophets. But God has no more secrets. Read the, book, read the end of Revelation, or read the end of Romans. The message I proclaimed about Jesus Christ in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past. Jesus was the mystery. Jesus was the secret. He's been revealed now. So what other secrets do the prophets have? In the past, God has spoken to us, uh, to our ancestors through the prophets and at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. The law and the prophets were till John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. Luke 16, 16. So let's, let's logically think about this concept. The church it's, gets its direction from living prophets and apostles. Your prophets, therefore, then come from a false prophet. And let's demonstrate that. Number one. Brigham Young Young taught the Adam-God theory slash doctrine. Now, if you want to argue it's a theory, that's fine. I'm okay with that. Regardless, he did teach this, and he did teach it to other people. There are numerous sources on this. They're not disputed. This was denounced as false. As Spencer Kimball said, we warn you against the dissemination of doctrines that are not according to the scriptures and which are alleged to have been taught by some of the general authorities of past generations, such such as, for instance, the Adam-God theory. We denounce that theory and hope that everyone will be cautioned against this and other kinds of false doctrines. According to Deuteronomy 13, this means you had a prophet lead you after a different god. That means he is a false prophet. So all your prophets come from Brigham Young. That means all your prophets, even the prophets you have today, come from a false prophet. Now, this isn't even touching the topic of Joseph Smith and some of the false prophecies that he gave, but we we don't need to get into that. But you then made the claim God intends to save all people, and exaltation is the continuation of family life. Um... I know you believe this. However, let's actually look at your beliefs. Let's look at what your what your standard works say, what your prophets and apostles have taught on this issue, and then let's see if God intends to save all people. First off, Moroni ten thirty two says, Come unto Christ and be perfected in him. And if you shall deny yourself of all ungodliness and love God with all your might, mind and strength, then Is his grace sufficient for you? Did you catch the if-then statement? If you shall deny yourself of all ungodliness and love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then is his grace sufficient for you. 2 Nephi 25-23 teaches, you know, um, you know that we are saved by grace after all we can do. Alma 11-37 teaches that 
He cannot save them in their sins. Jesus cannot save them in their sins. For I cannot deny his word. He has said that no unclean thing can inherit the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, how can ye be saved except if you inherit the kingdom of heaven? Therefore, you cannot be saved in your sins. Now, maybe I'm not interpreting this correctly. So let's look at what some of the prophets and apostles have taught. Spencer Kimball said, The Lord cannot forgive us in our sins. He can only save us from our abandoned sins. Theodore Burton said, Exaltation comes as a gift from God, dependent upon my obedience to God's laws. I cannot be exalted in my sins, but I must work to overcome them. Dolan Oak said, We must fulfill to qualify for the blessing of his atonement. We qualify for the promised blessing after all we can do. Theodore Burton said, Individual salvation is conditioned not only upon grace, but also upon obedience to the gospel law after all we can do. You can see some other <clears throat> people who spoke at General Conference, including Dolan Oaks in 92. What did he say? He said, what is all we can do? Surely includes repentance, baptism, keeping the commandments, and enduring to the end. Moroni pleaded, if you shall deny yourself of all ungodliness and love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then is his grace sufficient for you. Key word he says there, repentance. We'll get to that in a minute. There's some other quotes there you can examine by, by Bruce R. McConkie. Um, but, and Joseph F. Smith. The Book of Mormon teaches that you can, in fact, stop sinning. First Nephi 3, 7 says, you know, God gives no commandment you cannot keep. Joseph Worthen said, you can be obedient. The Lord does not expect anything of you that you cannot do. Therefore, if he gave you this commandment, it's something you can do. True repentance, according to Doctrine and Covenants, means you have stopped sinning. Behold, he who has repented of his sins, the same is forgiven, and I, the Lord, remember them no more. By this you may know if a man repenteth of his sins, he will confess and forsake them. For I, the Lord, cannot look upon sin in the least degree of allowance. Nevertheless, he that repents and does the commandments of the Lord shall be forgiven. And he that repents not from him shall be taken even the light which he has received. For my spirit shall not always strive with man. And now verily I say unto you, I, the Lord, will not lay any sin to your charge. Go your ways and sin no more. But unto the soul who sinneth shall the former sins return, saith the Lord your God. It's quite clear here that true repentance requires you to stop sinning. If you return to any of those sins, God can't forgive you. Keep in mind the Bible teaches there are sins we commit that we are not even aware of. You can turn to Numbers for more on this. There are other uh, quotes here from other uh, general conferences um, about repenting of your sin. You know, by this you may know, a man repenteth of his sins, he will confess, and he will forsake them. Dietrich Utorf said, True repentance, however, is the condition required so that God's forgiveness can come into our lives. You can see that Alma teaches that we must stop sinning in this life. Now, I do know this is a debated topic. There are several people who have st stated, uh, including Del Rey, <coughs> Delbert Stapley said, you know, we can repent in the afterlife. However, it's far more difficult. Um, Brigham Young taught it's actually a hundred times easier to repent here on earth than it is in the spirit world. You can stop sinning in this life, apparently. Best of luck. So what does this mean? The, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Standard Works, teaches hell is for those who are found filthy still. Well, this then condemns all Latter-day Saints. Because, as Doctrine and Covenant states, and altogether abideth in sin cannot be sanctified by the law, neither mercy, justice, nor judgment. Therefore, they must remain filthy still. All LDS people still who still abideth in sin, because none of them have ever, ever repented, because to truly repent, is to confess and forsake those sins. That means those people are still found filthy still. If you die in this life and you have sin that you have not forsaken, if you are not found sinless, then you're going to go to hell. That then means that for every honest person who admits they still have sin in their life, they're not going to be saved according to Latter-day Saint beliefs. And I think if we're being honest, most Latter-day Saints would admit they still have sin in their life. 
So you made the claim that our soul is eternal, not created. This is biblically not true. You know, Zechariah teaches that thus declares the Lord who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth and formed the spirit of man within him. Our souls can't be eternal if they are created. We have a heavenly mother. Um, this, this, I know, is a topic that the church hasn't revealed too much on and stuff like that. Um, but the Bible presents marriage as something that's temporarily instituted by God and, and humankind alone. Um, it's not something that we see <clears throat> outside of humans. Um, and it's not something we see in heaven. The pagan religions had their gods having wives, and God condemned this. Um, you can, of course, read more about this in, in passages like Jeremiah 44. Here's the thing I want you to think about, though. If this is true, if this Latter-day Saint belief is true, regardless, God's made it clear there is no God beside him, and he knows of, of no one, right? If this belief is true... If we have a heavenly mother, that means that heavenly father cheated on heavenly mother with Mary because your prophets, your apostles have taught that the father came down and begat Jesus the same way as we do now. Jesus is the only person who had our heavenly father as the, as the father of his body. So this means you have a God who as God sinned. Think about that. Logically, this is just, this is a train wreck if this is true. You have a God who, as God sinned, he cheated on his wife. Right? It's wild to think about. You stated that we live in an infinite cosmos. I would say Protestants believe this as well. However, as an LDS, you must believe in an infinite amount of cosmos um, with more gods than particles of matter. That was stated by Orson Pratt. Now, I think what you meant to say was that uh, Latter-day Saints believe in an infinite amount of cosmos, not just, you know, an infinite cosmos. Um, so God knows of no other God. Uh, there can't be more gods than particles of matter, yet God doesn't even know of another God. If that just, you have God lying then, um, that just doesn't make sense, right? Especially if, as Joseph Smith <coughs> taught that God... The Father himself once dwelled on a planet as Jesus himself did, right? You can find that in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, page 345, 346. And Joseph Smith says that. That then means God, Heavenly Father, worshipped a God prior to him. He doesn't know of any other God, but he worshipped a God prior to him. You know, you, you made the claim you have an all-knowing, all-powerful God, right? It just doesn't make sense. I do think it's interesting that we have had apostles teach, you have had apostles teach, that planets conceive. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, it's an infinite amount of cosmos with planets reproducing, uh, reproduction occurring. That's uh, it, it, interesting. But you said that God looks like us and created us in our image. So, you know, this, of course, comes from Genesis 1, right? 1, 26 through 27. Does it mean that we are literally created... <laughs> In his image. Wayne Grudem states the, the word image means an object similar to something else and often a representative of it. The word is used to speak of statues or, or replicas of uh, tumors and mice, of paintings, of soldiers on a wall, and of pagan idols or statues representing deities. Uh, the word likeness also means an object similar to something else, but it tends to be used more frequently in contexts where the idea of similarity is emphasized more than the idea of being a representative or substitute. Uh, King Aziz's model of the drawing of the altar he saw in Damascus is called a likeness, uh, as are the figures of bulls beneath the bronze altar and the wall uh, paintings of Babylonian chariot officers. Uh, the, the venom of the wicked is a likeness of the venom of a snake. Here the idea is that they are very similar in characteristics, but there is no thought of actual representation or substitution. All of this evidence indicates that the English words image and likeness are very accurate. In Genesis 5.3, we see the same exact language used to describe Adam producing his son. He became the father of a son in his own likeness according to his image. This doesn't mean they looked the same. It means they shared sim sim similar characteristics. I'll end with this phrase 
you know, this is one of my favorite Bible verses, uh, Mark 8, 36. You know, what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul?